The theme we're looking at today, looking at this passage, is what does a healthy church look like? What are some of the marks, some of the signs of a healthy church? I wonder what you would think of. I wonder what would be in your mind as you think of a healthy church. Because in today's passage, as I mentioned earlier, we get a glimpse into this early church, um, into their life. What were they doing? What were their priorities? What were they kind of focused on? This is a church that we look at and it is, it is alive, it is thriving, it is full of the Spirit. I'm thinking, well, that's what we long for, isn't it? So we long to be a thriving, Spirit-filled, revived church. Well, it's good for us to look this morning and say, well, what are some of the marks? What are some of the things that we can look out for here? If you're a Christian here this morning, this is, as we look at this, this is something we want to pray for for us as a church. We're not the perfect church. We've got a lot of things to learn. And so we want to be shaped by the Bible and to see, right, well, we need to be corrected in this area. Or maybe we need some more emphasis in this area. Or there's this that we're not doing. Or maybe there's things we can be encouraged in. Well, we, we are doing that, but let's keep on doing it. Well, let's pray this morning that we would be shaped by God's word. And if you're not a Christian here this morning, well, do see again, we're admitting we're not uh, the finished product. We, we're not the finished article. We need God's patience and help. Uh, we're not saying we're the perfect church. But this is what churches should be like. This is something of a blueprint for us on some of the priorities of what uh, a Christian Bible-believing church uh, should look like. So this morning, there are, there are more than this, really. We could stretch it out or we could shrink it, but I've picked up six marks for us to look at of a healthy church. And I think, well, that's going to take a while, but they're short. <laughs> the first point is probably, uh, first few points are probably the longest, but then they're quite short, so don't worry um, if you think we're going to go on uh, way longer than normal. It's a normal length, but just six marks, that's what we'll look at. So the first mark of a, a healthy church is this. It's a distinctive church. A, a, a biblical, kind of faithful, uh, revived, spirit-filled church is a distinctive church. I would just quick recap on where we've been in Acts so far. Remember, Jesus has been raised from the dead, and then he spent 40 days with his followers, the apostles. He showed them proofs and taught them on who he was, and, and then they understood um, all that he came to do, and he trained them up. And then he went to, uh, ascended back to heaven, and he said, wait in Jerusalem for the power from on high. So the power of the Holy Spirit came on the followers of Jesus. There would have been about 120 of them at that point. And then as the Spirit filled them, he equipped them to speak in all these different languages because people from all over the world had gathered in Jerusalem. And they were talking and people said, we can understand you in our dialect, in our language. Why is this? And Peter stood up and we looked last week and he says, the reason is this is God's plan to reach the whole world. Jesus was the Messiah. And he's the promised one. Let me show you how he's the promised one. He went back to the Old Testament and said, look, he's the promised one. Jesus is the one we've been waiting for. But you killed the Messiah. Amen. You killed him, he said. And verse 7, 37, we saw last week that they were cut to the heart. They couldn't believe it. What, what have we done? And so they, they asked Peter, you know, they asked brothers, what? What are we to do now? We've killed the promised one. The one that God promised would come, we've killed him. And so Peter's response is, verse 38, repent. That is, turn from one direction to the total opposite direction. Stop going that way, go the other way. Instead of following yourself as Lord, put Jesus as Lord. Repent and be baptised. That is, show everybody now what you've done. You've had a new start. You've been washed clean. You're united to Jesus Christ. You're united to his people. And what happened? Well, 3,000 people um, were saved that day. But as he talks to them, notice what he says in verse 40. He says, look, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Now, different versions of the Bible have slightly different translations of that word crooked. Some might say corrupt. The meaning there is unjust. You know, out of line, not right. Here's, here's a world around you, here's a, a generation, a, a culture that is, that is crooked, that is not right, uh, that is broken. And he says, save yourselves from it. And as part of that, he says, repent. And then they form this group of believers, 3,000 of them trusted. It's a big jump, isn't it? Going from 120 to 3,000 in one day. But do you see why they're called to be distinctive? Why they were called to be different from the world around. Because he's saying, look, that's a, it's a crooked generation around. It's unjust. They, they, they don't know who they're following. They're all over the place. 
But we're calling you to follow the Lord Jesus. He's to be your master and Lord. So instead, and that's what it is to look like. If you're part of a church, you're to repent from Jesus being the, uh, from um, you being the Lord to Jesus being the Lord. You've now got a different boss. You know, under new management is written over Christians because now they follow somebody else. So go a different way. But that means if you're turning to go the other way, anybody else who hasn't followed Jesus is still walking in the opposite direction. I don't know if you've had that situation where you've been on a busy kind of public transport, maybe you've got off a train and you want to go in one direction and everybody else seems to be going the other way. You kind of start to feel, don't we? Or maybe I'm going the wrong way. They've done tests, haven't they? They've done kind of psychological tests with people in lifts. You know lifts that have two doors? Have you seen those lifts? Sometimes they've put people, set people up in there to face the wrong way, to, to face the door that isn't going to open. And a person goes in and they know which door is going to open, but because everybody else is facing the other way, they feel like they ought to turn as well because there's a pressure, isn't there, to conform to those around you. And we can feel that as Christians. Everybody else seems to be going in the other way. Everybody else seems to be believing different things to us. And the temptation is just to go with the flow. But we're called to be distinctive. We're called to follow Jesus, to repent and follow him. Now, that means that a church, a group of people who are all doing that, well, in one sense, can you see how Sundays and our time together is a haven, isn't it? A time where we we don't have to fight against the crowd because, you know, we're we're here and we're we're together. We're worshipping the same God. We're rejoicing in the same Saviour. This is to be a time where we can, ah, we can know peace. Because the battles that we face in our daily lives, well, here we don't have to face. We don't have to pretend because we're all sinners here. That's why we prayed that prayer earlier because we admit, Lord, we've all failed. We don't have to pretend here anymore. Uh, but so often church can't, isn't that, isn't it? So often we do, have, we do kind of put on a mask and pretend. But ideally, the ideal, the mark here is to be distinctive, different. A place where we are uh, united together under the lordship of Jesus. But that means as well, as a church that we are to be different from the world. That doesn't mean we're to be weird. It doesn't mean we have to go out of our way to be strange. Because there are going to be things that we do that is going to be strange whatever happens, isn't it? We've stood up this morning and we've, we've sung together, sung songs. That doesn't happen often nowadays. We have prayed to God. Uh, we have uh, met together we're all from different backgrounds, different upbringings and things. And, and yet we're together. There's going to be things that are strange about church. Uh, and, and so we will be different. It doesn't mean mean we have to go out of our way to be strange. We want to be understandable to people who might not normally come. We want to explain what we're doing. But church will be a distinctive place. But as well, um, God calls us to be kind of set apart, doesn't he? Calls us to be different. It means as a church, we don't follow every trend of thinking of the day, but we go back to the Bible and we say, well, what does the Bible say? What does Jesus want to tell us about how we are to live? We're called to be different. We're called to be distinctive. So as Christians, one uh, writer put it like this, we're to be thermostats, not thermometers. Think of the difference between a thermostat and a thermometer. A thermometer is affected by the atmosphere around it, isn't it? A A thermometer shows you what's happening. But a thermostat... That affects everything. So there's a thermostat in here. It's controlling the the atmosphere in here, the heat. A thermometer wouldn't be able to do anything about it. It just kind of accepts what's there and tells you what's there. We're to be thermostats. We're to affect the culture around us. Uh, Make a difference, not let it affect us. In a culture uh, and uh, in a society where things just can often seem chaotic, where one generation to the next, we're believing different things about other things and everything's all over the place. Isn't it wonderful to say, no, we want to hold on to the truth. We want to come back to who God is and what he's like. And that's what the Bible shows us. In 1 Timothy 3, Paul calls the church the pillar and buttress of the truth. We're to hold on to the truth. Even though there might be storms going on all around, blowing us and telling we should go the other way. We hold on to what God wants us to believe. And we say, no, we're going to stick to Jesus. We're going to stick to him. Now, maybe you're not a Christian here today. And you just feel lost in this world because you don't know what to believe. There's so many things being thrown at you and you're longing for something solid. Well, that's what the the Bible holds out for us. That's what Christians believe. Something that we have believed for centuries. A message of hope that Jesus doesn't change. God remains the same. Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forever. What a foundation we've got to build our life on. And if you are a Christian, 
here's a call and a reminder to us. If you feel like you're going against the flow, that's okay. Broad is the road that leads to destruction, isn't it? Narrow is the path that leads to life, Jesus says. So keep going and keep our eyes on Jesus. He went against the flow before us and he's with us every step of the way. And we have one another to help us in that. So we're called to be, number one, a distinctive church. Secondly, we're called to be a learning church. What's the sign or the mark of a healthy church? A healthy church is a learning church. Now we'll have this glimpse into this early church life in verse 42. We're told there they devoted themselves, that is, they intensely committed themselves to certain things. What are we told? First thing, to the apostles' teaching. Now they committed themselves, they were devoted to what the apostles, these 12 men, Uh, who Jesus had appointed to teach them and to teach these things, they were were intensely committed to listening to their teaching. Now, why the apostles' teaching? Well, because remember where the apostles have been. They'd been with Jesus for 40 days and had this amazing kind of training and teaching in who Jesus was and why he came. This is where we see... um, Peter gets these these things from, uh, the teaching from in Acts 2. And we see later on where the other apostles, they get uh, the teaching from Jesus. So they are speaking with an authority that is different to we have today. You know, they were teaching in a way that's saying, look, this is what God says. This is teaching from Jesus. And then you might wonder, well, how can we trust the apostles? How can we know that they are really from God? Well, verse 43 helps us with that because it tells us they they did many wonders and signs through the apostles. So the apostles were doing these amazing miracles and that was God's way of saying, they're with me, they're mine. So if you look back in Acts 2.22, a similar thing is said about Jesus. Remember, Jesus of Nazareth, verse 22, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. So how do we know who, the, what Jesus, who Jesus was, that he was the son of God? Because he did these amaz- amazing miracles. He healed people. He fixed them when they were broken. He cast out demons, even brought dead people to life. And you look at him and you think, wow, this is, God is, is, is here amongst us. And then the apostles, as we read on, we're going to see they do these amazing miracles. They, they cast out demons. They heal people. You know, they bring people from death to life and you think, hang on, that's a bit like what Jesus did. And there is God attesting, saying, look, you can trust these men. Trust them. I'm I'm attesting them to you. I'm showing them that you can trust them. Certified by God. That's why we see these miracles here. And does that mean that we don't see miracles and things today? Well, of course not. We can't restrict God, can we? We can't say, well, God doesn't do that. No, he can do whatever he wants in however way he wants. But... The work that the apostles did here were for this time to show you can trust them. And then we think, well, how can we access this teaching now? Well, that's what the the New Testament is. The New Testament is the apostles' writing. See, we can trust this and now we've got, well, we can go to the Bible and say, you know, this is from God. This is God's teaching. It's not man-made, but certified by him. That's why when you look at in one of Peter's letters, he talks about Paul's letters. And he says, I know they're hard to understand. Some of the scriptures are hard hard to understand. He uses the word scripture to describe Paul's writing. Isn't that amazing? Well, so he had, it has this authority. So today, how can we be people devoted to the apostles' teaching since we're not with the apostles anymore? Well, we've got their written down words. And remember, Jesus said to them, the Holy Spirit will bring back these things to you for you to remember. So you've got the written, empowered by the Spirit, um, helping us uh, f- to know who God is and what he's like. That's what the Bible is. So a question for us as a church, are we committed, are we committed, intensely committed to the Bible and to what God wants us to believe? Do we learn from it? Are we growing in it? Are we, um, that means it, it doesn't get dusty. Our Bible shouldn't be dusty, but we should be enjoying them and reading them. And that's one of the reasons we're doing our reading the Bible together. Because reading the Bible can be hard, can't it? We can forget. Life can get busy. We don't all have um, an uh, apron like Susanna Wesley to put over our heads as we were hearing earlier. We, you know, what, what, what do we do? It's so easy for us to forget. And that's why it's good to have, a, at the end of the month, I'm going to be talking to other people about what I've read. It can gives us a bit of, like, a bit of an encouragement to read some books in the Bible together. 
But as well, it's good for us to do it together, good for us to look together at God's word now, but really to ask that question personally for us. Are we devoted to it? Are we reading it? Here is God's word. Here is his love letter to you. You know, it's easier for us not to get excited about a book if we think it's kind of God's handbook for life. Now, in a sense, we know what that's meaning, but it's more than that. It's not just a book of rules. This is God who loves you dearly. He's written this book which is all about his love and his salvation for you. And he wants to talk to you. So every day you have the potential to open up God's word and to read it and to say, God, I want you to talk to me. Now, I know it's hard. And I know sometimes it's a slog and we can go through days and weeks, maybe months, where we try and read it and, and nothing seems to happen. It kind of, it's hard. But there are moments, if we keep doing that, where God will break in and he will speak in power where he will draw close. And we just need to keep going, keep reading. So maybe you're in one of those ruts at the moment when you're reading the Bible. Maybe you've kind of forgotten about it or given up. Let this be an encouragement to us. Let's be devoted to God's word. Let's get excited about what God can talk to us and what he can say to us in it. Because he's got something he wants to say to you this week. Go and find it in God's word. Go and enjoy it in his, um, in his word together. You know, if you ask the question... How do you get struck by lightning? What's the answer? I know you don't want to be, but if you did want to be, the answer isn't you go and hide down in a basement. If you want to be struck by lightning, you want to kind of make yourself soaking wet, go and stand on the top of Pushtarjurch over there with a big metal rod or a golf club or something, stand up there in the middle of a lightning storm, then you know there's more of a chance you get struck by lightning than hiding in a basement, isn't there? Yep. Why am I saying that? How can we know God's presence and hear God speaking to us? We put ourselves in a position and the means that he uses. How does he use it? Through the Bible. So often he comes to his people through the Bible. So let's read it. Let's get to know it. Let's devote ourselves to it. Spurgeon said of, um, of John Bunyan, you know, John Bunyan who wrote Pilgrim's Progress. This is what um, Spurgeon wrote about him. You read anything of his and you'll see it's almost like reading the Bible itself. He'd studied our, our authorised version of the Bible till his whole being was saturated with scripture. And through his, those writings are charmingly full of poet, poetry, yet he cannot give us his Pilgrim's Progress, that sweetest of all prose poems, without in, continually making us feel and say, this man is living the Bible. Prick him anywhere and you'll find that his blood is Bibline. The very essence of the Bible flows from him. He cannot speak without quoting a text but his soul is full of the word of God. A great description. If you pricked John Bunyan, you would believe the Bible. Well, are we filling our minds and hearts with God's word? Are we letting it shape us? Are we getting excited about it? Um, yeah, don't just do it when we kind of think, oh, I'll do it when I feel like it. No, we say, no, I, I want to be devoted to it, devoted to God's word. That's why Bible teaching is such a central part of our time together on a Sunday as well, isn't it? We want, we want to know, God, what do you want to say to us? That's why a good chunk of my week is spent preparing this because think about what does God want to say to us as a church? Because we want to be a church that is a learning church, devoted to God's word, devoted to the apostles' teaching. So we're to be a distinctive church. A, a, a healthy church is a learning church. The third thing is a healthy church is a loving church. Look at verse 42. So they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship. Notice it says the fellowship not just fellowship. So they were committed, totally intensely committed to one another. That's what that's telling us. Not just one day a week, but day by day. So it was formal. They went to the temple together and it was at home. They were around each other's home. So it was big and small. And they were breaking bread together. And they were having a meal, but it says break, you know, it says there, can you see the breaking of bread? That is um, not just having a meal, but communion. So remembering the Lord's death together. So they were having meals together, sharing communion together. Now remember, this was 3,000 people. They weren't from um, Jerusalem, all of them. Some would have been, but some would have been from further away. So there they were in this new city, thinking, well, what are we going to do? But they looked after each other, which we'll see uh, here. But they kind of said, well, you'll have to come around ours now. Come and have food with us. And as they had food, they, they spoke about Jesus. And they, they broke bread together. And they shared communion. Something about that, isn't it, is so important. It's been so good for us, isn't it, as a church to every now and again, uh, more recently, have meals together. 
And it's great for us all to eat together because there's something about having food with somebody. You get a bit deeper in conversation than you would just in passing. It gives us a chance to get to know each other and, and see the needs that we have. And it's the same when you invite people over to your house. It's a really important part of saying, oh, come over for a cup of tea, come over for some food, because then we get to know each other. Then we get to talk a bit more. You know, we, we can let our guard down a bit, as it were, and relax. And then as we're real with one another, we can share, look, this is something I found hard. This is something that I've been struggling with. Because part of being in this loving fellowship, do you see what they did in verse 44? All who believed were together and had all things in common. They were selling possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all, as many as had need. So they were getting some things that they had. They were saying, well, I don't need that and sell that. And they got the money and they gave it and they shared that with other people in the fellowship who had need. Remember, people would have been away from their homes, away from Jerusalem. They needed somewhere to stay. They needed things to do. And so they supported each other uh, financially. It doesn't mean that they didn't mean they have to sell absolutely everything they had, because some of them, verse 46, had to have homes to invite people to break bread in them, verse 46. So they didn't just sell everything and then club it all together. No, they still had their own possessions, but they shared things. They looked out for each other's needs, because they knew each other, and they knew each other and what they were going through. And so if there was a person in need, they wanted to help them. And that, that's something, isn't it, just to remind us of, that we want to be committed to one another to the fellowship, and to pray for one another, to love one another, and to keep doing that more and more. In the early church, the amount they loved one another was a huge reason that the church grew and grew and grew. If you look back on this time, it was taking part in the, kind of, in the Roman Empire, I think today, where's the Roman Empire? Well, it's just in history books, isn't it? You can just see kind of artifacts of it, just, it's just crumbled. But where's the Church of Jesus Christ? Still growing. Still going forward. If you look at the history books, um, the non-Christians were writing about the church. And they said this. Uh, a few years after this, Tertullian uh, noted, he said, um, how non-Christians would comment on the, uh, just they were amazed at how the Christians, he said this, see how they love one another. That's what stood out to these historians. And in the fourth century, the pagan emperor Julian said, these impious Galileans not only feed their own poor, but ours also. They welcome them into these feasts of love. They attract them as children were attracted with cakes. You see, that love between them just spoke volumes to the outsiders. Now, this isn't something that's enforced. This was a natural outflowing of knowing the Spirit of God with them. The Spirit of God in their hearts forced them to kind of, wow, I've got to love this. If God has loved me that much, Because when they met together, what did they do? They had the breaking of bread. So at the heart of their time together was the gospel. God has sacrificially loved me. He has given everything for me. As I look at the death of Jesus, as I see his body broken, as I remember his blood being shed, he's done that for me, then I can do that for others. I can share and love him. So can you see it? A healthy church isn't just something like we turn up on a Sunday and that's it. No, this is something we're committed to one another. Like a family, the New Testament shows it like that, like a household, it says. So how can we as a church continue to grow in that? That's something for us to pray through, isn't it? Things that we need to put in place. How could we be praying and supporting each other? How can we be loving one another? How can we be opening our homes up to one another and sharing together? These are, these, this is what the mark of a healthy church is. And there are lots of ways in which uh, we're doing this well. But there's lots of ways we can be doing it better, aren't there? And grow more and more in this. So let's pray, Lord, make us a loving church. This is the mark of a healthy church. Showing the love of God for, between each other as the outsiders look in and say, wow, see how they love each other. And we say, well, the only reason we love is because God first loved us. That's the only reason. So this church, the marks of, distinctive, of a, um, a healthy church is distinctive, it's learning, it's loving. It's also a, a praying church. They devoted themselves to uh, apostle teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and the prayers, the prayers. So that is, they devoted themselves to praying together. 
It, the prayers kind of implies that they had set prayers that they read out. So that's one of the reasons I wanted us to read a prayer this morning. It's okay to read a prayer. It doesn't take away from uh, the spontaneity of it, but the church has been doing it for years. They've had these set prayers where they read. Maybe you struggle in prayer and you think, well, I don't know what to say. Well, it's okay to find written prayers that the church history of you, uh, church have used over the, their history and say, well, I'll read this to, just to help me in my prayers. Read the Psalms to help me. But here they were, they were committed to pray and devoted to praying. They knew God was real. They knew his presence with them. The spirit had filled them. And so they wanted to pray to God. They wanted to ask him to draw near. They knew that they couldn't live without him. Remember the description we learned of prayer a few weeks ago. It is learned uh, dependence. Just learning to depend on God. And the more we see our need, the more we will pray. We have a wonderful privilege as believers to speak to the God of heaven directly. We can speak to him any time, any moment. We might feel unworthy, but we know because of the assurance of forgiveness that we have in the gospel that we can come to him. Our sins washed clean and we can pray. What a privilege. And yet, so often we neglect it, don't we? So often we go through our lives and we don't pray. We do it in our own strength. Well, true prayer and to be a praying church, it's not going to come through a new program. It's not going to come through guilt trip. I could make you feel guilty about not being in prayer meeting or not praying. I could do that. But it's not going to make any long lasting change. The only thing that's going to help us is if we see we cannot do this without God's help. I'm at the end of myself. As I've said before, prayer meeting isn't for those who've reached some kind of level of prayer. It's for those who realise they can't do anything without prayer, without Jesus. It's those who are on their knees and saying, God, we need you. We're weak. Prayer can only realise when we have this amazing privilege, access to the power of heaven. And God, in his amazing sovereignty, uses the prayers of his people to push the kingdom of God forward. We can't understand why. He doesn't need us, but he uses us. And he uses our prayers to accomplish that. So let's be a church together praying. But as well individually, that means, isn't it, that we're committed and devoted to prayer. As I said, don't don't be afraid if you're struggling in prayer to read some psalms. Maybe an old hymn. If you want a hymn book, we've got old hymn books you can take and use hymns to help you to pray. Use these written down prayers. There's a wonderful book called The Valley of Vision, which is old Puritan prayers written down. If you need help like that to help you to pray, then just ask and I can get those for you. But really, these just put into words our desires and uh, what we long for. Let's be a praying church, dependent on God, and see him answer prayer in wonderful ways. So look out this week for ways in which God has answered prayer. Pray specific prayers for this week ahead. And just let's encourage each other on how God has answered us uh, next time we're together. So a, a healthy church is distinctive, it's learning, it's loving, it's praying. The fifth thing we see is it's a worshipping church. So these Christians were gathered together and look what happens as they pray and as they spend time together. Um, We see in verse 43, awe came upon every soul. Awe comes upon them. So this gathering of believers was a place where there was awe and an awareness of God's greatness and majesty. What is it to be awe inspired by something? Well, that's the kind of thing you have when you see something amazing, isn't it? Maybe if you see, a, you, know, you walk inside to a very grand cathedral, you think, wow, this is, this is amazing, awe inspiring. Or you see an amazing view, like the Grand Canyon, or you climb up a hill over here and you, you just see this glorious view, and you think, wow, awe inspiring. And as they were gathered together, they were just so aware of God's amazing power and greatness. As they stepped into his presence, as they were, they were filled with this awe. But not only awe, look how they were told in verse 46. We told that they, they received their food, they had glad and generous hearts, and they were praising God. So they, this wasn't just kind of like a, um, everybody was very still and there was no movement and just in awe, but there was joy and celebration as well because of what they were experiencing. You know, as churches and different, as Christians, we're very good at extremes. We're very good at um, yeah, just really spotting out what's different between us. You know, some, some churches will say, you've got to be awe-filled, and it's got to be reverent. And other churches say, no, 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 it's got to be joy-filled. It's got to be jubilant. And yet this early church, what do we see? Oh, we see both. It's not either or. 
We need to be a place where we have this awe and reverence of God because he is holy and great and powerful, but also we have this joyful intimacy that he is near and close and we can follow him. So as we see in this passage, we've got this wonderful balance of glad and generous, joyful Christians, um, and they had kind of in this formal sense of going to the temple and praising God there, but as well we have this kind of um, just awareness of God's greatness and awe in his presence. John Stott in his commentary says this, it's right to be dignified in public worship, but it's unforgivable to be dull. (laughs) We can't be dull. This is exciting that we get to worship God and praise him. Uh, And so how can that be dull? That we come to to God to praise his name, to enjoy Jesus. We're joining with heaven in worshiping God. That is something that should fill us with excitement as well as awe. So let's be a church that has this balance of uh, as we worship. And and let's ask the question, is worshipping God something we're serious about? When we're joining together, as we're singing praise to God, is that something we're really engaging in with a sincere heart, joyfully doing it, and at the same time aware of God's greatness and having this reverence before him? You know, singing has a purpose, isn't it? It's to get truths from our head to our heart. Otherwise, we just say things, and that's not enough. But if we sing things so often when we have a melody and a tune to it, it takes truths in a powerful way, from our mind into our hearts to make them kind of more real to us. So let's pray that we would be uh, a church where we have this true, wonderful worship of God. And it's not just an individual thing, but we do it together. So we're a, worship, a, a sign of a healthy church is to be a worshipping church. And the last thing is it's to be a witnessing church, very briefly. Do you see what this church does and how this group of people has this effect on the area. They were praising God, verse 70, having favour with all people, and the Lord added to the number every day. So they had favour with all people. So in a few chapters, we're going to see they're going to face immense persecution and uh, being sentenced to death. But people couldn't deny they were different. People couldn't deny there was something about them uh, that, that they, there was positive. They had a positive impact on those around them. And so the people, they had good favour with them. Now, the message was still the same we have. It's a message that is hard to hear. And yet people were aware of, wow, God, well, look at what God has done. Look at how he has um, worked in their lives. And what happened? Verse 47, God added to their number. The Lord added to their number daily, the people who were being saved. Can you see what's happening here? God was real to this group of people. The Spirit had filled them. And when God is real, they just told other people about what had happened in their lives. They couldn't help but talk about it. You know, in the same way that we can't help but talk about the disastrous weather we've had since October. You know, because it's real to us. We're really disappointed. And we just, when we see the sun, we can't believe it. And why do we talk about that with others? Because it's real. And it's something that affects our lives. When God is real and he affects our lives, we will want to talk to others about him. So the challenge to us is, well, if we're not talking about him, is he really real in our hearts? Is he really real in our lives? Let's pray that we would be a church where God is real amongst us so that we can naturally just talk about it all around. And look how this church is growing in verse 47. Who was adding to their number? Who was it, verse 47? The Lord. Jesus was adding to their number. You know, Jesus saw this group of people who were delighting in him praying to him, rejoicing in him, how would he not just say, right, I want more people to be part of that? Come on, come and be part of this, part of this. A healthy church is a growing church because nothing delights Jesus more than to put people in that position. So let's pray that we would be a witnessing church and pray that the Lord would add to our number and other gospel churches around us. So here's six things, the marks of a healthy church. God did wonderful things for this church. Now, before we finish, remember, this isn't a formula. This isn't something, right, if we do these things, then we will see this happening. No, no, we want to try our best to do this as best we can. But only God can bring the growth. In the same way, if you think of Elijah in the Old Testament, he built the altar, didn't he? He put all the things in place, put the stones there, the wood, and everything was there. But God brought the fire. So as a church, we want to be those who are gathering the sticks, as it were, gathering the sticks of being distinctive, uh, trying our hardest to be learning and devoting ourselves to teaching, devoting ourselves to each other. We want to be uh, praying together. We want to be worshipping and witnessing and do putting all those sticks in. And all the while we say, Lord, bring the fire. Lord, bring your spirit. Come and bring this to light. 
and set this place, as it were, alight with your greatness and majesty. So let's pray that we would be a church with these marks for the glory of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together as we close. Father in heaven, there's so much for us to see about your people here. And we thank you for this great little picture, this example to us of who you are uh, and uh, what your people were like in those early days. Help us, Lord, now to pray these things into action in our life as a church, that we would be a healthy church and that we would bring glory to the name of Jesus and that, Lord Jesus, you would see fit to add to our numbers because, Lord, this is a place where your people will be looked after and safe and cared for and brought up in the faith. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.